You know, uh, Docker just turned 18 months old, and um, this all feels a little surreal. You know, I'm used to thinking of Docker like most 18 months old, you know, something that stumbles and spits up on you and keeps you up at night. And uh, to be here at reInvent and to have AWS and a, uh, the cloud pioneer that it is not only launch a Docker-based service, but do it in a, such a Docker ethos-friendly way is really incredible. And by Docker ethos-friendly, I mean they've used native Docker interfaces, they are respecting portability, and perhaps most importantly, through the integration with Docker Hub, they're recognizing that Docker isn't just a, a container technology, but it's a huge ecosystem. I also feel really grateful because between Werner and Paul and, uh, and Patrick, they did such a great job of describing the what of Docker and containers that I can take a step back and talk a little bit about the why. And so why did Solomon and the rest of the team create Docker? Why are we so passionate about it? It's really because we think we're entering uh, and enabling a new world uh, of applications. And it's a future of applications that's predicated on the notion that developers are fundamentally content creators. Developers are fundamentally authors. And if we look throughout history, we see that amazing things happen when you liberate authors from the concerns about production and distribution. And you know, of course, there was a time when the only books that were produced were by you know, monks scribbling away in dark cellars. Uh, and then you had the printing press, and then you had the internet. And now, of course, if you want to publish something, you don't have to worry about what the packets are. You don't have to worry about which routers it's going across, or whether those are the same routers that were used yesterday. It just happens. You know, the internet is a universal publishing platform, except for that class of authors that we call developers, who today are still largely stuck in the dark ages. And you know, I'm not trying to imply that every developer is celibate and works in a dark cellar. Um, but we still spend an inordinate amount of time worrying about things like getting access to servers, or worrying about dependencies, or versions of dependencies, or rewriting work that others have done. Um, and that really shouldn't be the case. The internet should be a universal computing com platform in the same way that it's a universal publishing platform. And there's some reasons why it isn't. I mean, most of the uh, infrastructure that's in place now tightly links applications to infrastructure because it was designed back in an era when applications lived a long time, when they were monolithic and built on a single stack, and when they were deployed to a single server. And all three of those things have changed. And so if we think about what the distributed applications of the future are going to be, it's really quite different. Uh, of course, the applications are rapidly changing. Uh, they're built from multiple loosely coupled components that are themselves rapidly changing. And their need to somehow make all of these rapidly changing applications and versions of applications and languages and frameworks work consistently together and work consistently as a unit as you move from dev to QA to prod, but also as you go into production, as you scale uh, across clusters, as you move from physical to virtual, as you burst to the cloud, et cetera. And in fact, we want to get to the point where we can have multiple different components uh, stored on different servers and on different clusters and still interact uh, consistently. Now, that's a, that's a tall order. But fortunately, we've already made a lot of progress towards this kind of model, as you saw through the demos, uh, both Patrick's and Paul's. And we have a good roadmap to follow. And again, I think future is a, uh, the past is a good guide here. So if you've been to any Docker talks, you know we talk ad nauseum about shipping containers, simply because they're a good model for how you can have a similar separation of concerns. You know, in the case of shipping containers, how do you separate the manufacturer's issues from the shipper's issues? And how do you make sure you can put anything inside it and move it from ship to train to truck to crane? Um, and the shipping container industry went through five steps. And we're going to go through the five, same five steps as we try and get to a world of fully Dockerized uh, distributed applications. So step one has sort of been happening for the past 10 years. And that's the great work that the people who have worked on the low-level technology in Linux containers and Solaris zones and uh, BSD jails worked on, giving you the ability to isolate a process and run it uh, in a lightweight way uh, on an OS. And that's fantastic. What we've been doing at Docker uh, over the past 18 months is steps two and three. So step two was to take that, that sort of that plain steel box and turn it into a shipping container, if you will. Or take that notion of, uh, of a container, but make it uh, portable, give it the equivalent of hooks and holes, good APIs, uh, so that it's standard and can work anywhere. And when we did this, Step three happened in a remarkably short amount of time. And we suddenly saw a profusion uh, where every major operating system and every major cloud provider and every major DevOps tool supported Docker. 
We have now over 700 non-Docker Inc. employees contributing to the code. We have over 16,000 projects on GitHub that provide tooling around Docker. And if you go to Docker Hub, you'll find over 50,000 languages, frameworks, applications that the community has contributed uh, to make it possible to run Docker. And that ecosystem is so powerful that now we really can take any Linux application, uh, package it up in seconds into a container, test it in seconds, and deploy it uh, without modification or delay to, to virtually any server. And that's amazing. And now the next 18 months are about steps four and five. Because what works really well with single containers or small numbers of Docker containers, we want to make work well for large multi-container applications running across different data centers. And that's the multi-Docker application model. And as Werner said, there's a lot that we need to do around scheduling and around clustering and around composition and around networking and storage. Uh, and if you come to the Docker talk later today, you can hear about what's happening. But I think the critical thing is not only the technology, but that we do it in an open way so that all of that portability and all of that ecosystem isn't lost when you go from single container to multi-container. And that's part of the reason why I'm so thrilled about the uh, EC2 uh, container service launch, uh, because it really does respect this notion of being integrated with Docker Hub and using native interfaces and enabling app portability, not just within AWS, but between on-premise and AWS. And that's a fantastic thing, and it will result in tremendous, uh, tremendous benefits, not only for developers, but for companies. Now, you heard uh, Patrick talk about what Docker and AWS do for Pristine. I'll talk quickly about another company, uh, Gilt, which has, is a joint AWS and Docker customer. And Gilt, of course, is a Flash ETL site. And as you can imagine, they want to do a lot of experiments, but they also have to deal with big surges in traffic uh, and rapid growth and lots of different products. Um, before Docker and AWS, they had seven monolithic apps. It took weeks to go from dev to deploy with Docker. They've moved from monolithic apps to 300 microservices that go from dev to deploy in minutes and enable them to do over 100 different experiments a day. And that's an amazing result for Gilt. Um, and they're one of thousands of customers that are using Docker. And it's not just web companies. It's now hospitals and banks and uh, government institutions. And beyond them, of course, we're really excited because Docker has also just passed an important milestone. We've passed our, five, our 50 millionth download which means that there are going to be lots of developers out there helping to drive this revolution. So we don't have time for questions, but um, you know, I will address a question that I'm frequently asked, which is, you know, which technologies will win and lose in a Docker-based, a container-based uh, world? And the answer is I don't really know. Docker is a disruptive technology, and so some vendors will win and some vendors will lose. But I think the more interesting question is what happens and who wins when we liberate developers from uh, worrying about content, uh, sorry, worry, worrying about issues of production and worries of issues of distribution? What happens when we liberate applications from infrastructure? What, who wins when we liberate all of that creativity from the developers? And I think the answer there is pretty clear. We all win. Thank you.